Hello and welcome to our afternoon session, our final session of the day. My name is William Wood. I am an associate professor of philosophical theology at the University of Oxford. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, Ian McFarland, Professor Ian McFarland. Ian is the Regis Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. Before that, he held posts at Emory University in the United States and at the University of Aberdeen. He publishes widely in systematic and historical theology. Most recently, he has written a book on the doctrine of creation entitled From Nothing, A Theology of Creation. And today, he will speak to us on his paper, Extra Carnum and a Sarkos, Thoughts on the Logic of Incarnation. Please welcome Professor William Trump. Thanks, Phil, and uh, thanks to Alan and uh, all the organizers of the conference. I flatter myself that generally I try to write theology in a fairly ecumenical vein and theology that is also uh, exegetically pretty attentive to scripture. However, I find myself today riding a Lutheran hobby horse and uh, <laughs> using very little scripture, uh, and furthermore, it's nap time. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, I'm tempted to say sweet dreams, but um, <laughs> what I am trying to get at in this paper uh, is to examine one very particular, and again, it can come across as pretty picky you an aspect of the central challenge that Tom Wright presented to us yesterday. Namely, what does it mean to say uh, the Word was in the beginning with God and also became flesh and dwelt among us? So, hence, uh, extra cardam and arsarkos, uh, thoughts on the logic of the incarnation. My aim in this paper is to draw together two Christological topics that to my mind are closely related but have tended to be treated separately, the so-called extra-Calvinisticum and the Logos of Sarkos. Their separation can be accounted for on a number of levels. The most obvious uh, relates to what might be described as the dogmatic location of the two topics within the divine economy. The extra-Calvinisticum refers to the question of whether the Eternal Son, the second person of the Trinity, continues to exist apart from or outside the flesh, extra carnum, after the Incarnation. By contrast, debates over the Logos Asarkos typically relate to the sons existing without flesh beforehand. A further factor, however, is the historical and ecclesiological context within which these issues became matters of theological concern. As the very description of the doctrine as the Calvinistic extra suggests, the extra Calvinisticum is a product of 16th century debates between Lutheran and Reformed theologians, with little immediate resonance beyond the bounds of magisterial Protestantism. The Logos Asarkos, on the other hand, has emerged as a matter of theological debate only within the last hundred years or so in response to modern epistemological concerns not linked to questions of confessional identity. These differences notwithstanding, I want to argue that their shared concern with the relation between the eternal word and the flesh of Jesus suggests a level of theological overlap that, if the pun may be allowed, is more than skin deep. So, to make this case, let me begin with the theologically more well-trodden question of the extra Calvinisticum. That way of describing the topic derives, of course, from the Lutherans, who viewed the claim that the word, once incarnate, could ever thereafter be viewed as separate from the flesh as a peculiarly reformed innovation. Needless to say, the validity of that judgment both was and is hotly contested. In any event, the reasoning of the reformed on this matter is clear enough. They maintain that to deny that the word continues to exist extra carnum after the incarnation is either to reduce the divine word to finite human dimensions or to divinize Christ's humanity. In either case, the distinction between divinity and humanity is blurred, and the Chalcedonian insistence that in the hypostatic union the divine and human natures were united without confusion or change violated. The Lutherans countered that the Reformed position falls afoul of the other two Chalcedonian adverbs. It could hardly be the case that Christ's two natures by united without division or separation, they argued, if the divine word continues to subsist apart from Jesus' flesh after assuming it. Such a claim, they insisted, just cannot be squared with the biblical principle that in Christ the whole fullness of Godhead dwells bodily. Early in the 20th century, Karl Barth helpfully summarized the terms of the debate as follows, quote, Depending on whether it shies away more from the extreme of Christ absent from the world, the reform tendency, or from Christ present as the world, the Lutheran risk, 
And bearing in mind that there is no clear third option out there, one will have to decide today either for the Lutheran or the Reformed view, conscious of the problems present in both. Although Bart's summary is admirably balanced, all too often, caricatures based in the long history of interconfessional polemics have impeded honest assessment of the two positions. For example, the standard Lutheran account of the debate from the 16th century right up to the present argues that the Reformed insistence that the eternal word continues to exist outside of Christ's flesh is born of captivity to the metaphysical principle that finite humanity is not able to contain the infinite divine nature. One contemporary Lutheran, for example, avers that the classical Reformed position, quote, implies a very loose linkage between the Logos and the man Jesus of Nazareth and led to a theology of glory opening the doors to exalted language about the Logos apart from its enfleshment, unquote. So stated, the opposition between the two sides could not be clearer. Yet the tendentiousness of this characterization of the reform position is clear from the account of the extra Calvinisticum found in Heinrich Heppe's classic compendium Reform Dogmatics. I'll quote a bit extensively here. Christ so assumed the human nature into the unity of his person that since his incarnation, although as the Father's eternal Son, he also exists in an infinite way outside the assumed humanity, that's the extra, his will personally is as redeemer of the world never to be thought of, believed in, or called upon apart from his humanity at all. Indeed, even before his appearance in the flesh, it was only possible to believe in him as the one who intended to come in the flesh. Close quote. If this weren't enough, Hepha goes on to say that not only is it the case that we human beings are unable to think of the Son of God apart from his flesh, but, quote, the Father himself never knows the Son otherwise than as the Son came in the flesh." Unquote. In light of such assertions, it should be clear that the Reformed are no less keen than the Lutherans to reject any weakening of the link between the eternal word and the flesh of Jesus. What then is the substance of the disagreement? The point of the extra is to guard against understanding the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus as a matter of the local or spatial coincidence of the two natures. The Reformed therefore draw a distinction between the separation of the two natures, which they deny, and the non-inclusion of the divine and the human, which they affirm. According to this perspective, the word at no point abandons Jesus' humanity, which would constitute a separation, but the human cannot at every point be coincident with the word. In short, they insist that personal union cannot be understood to mean that the word is bound by the flesh. Otherwise, it would be necessary to ascribe divine properties like omnipresence to Christ's human nature in a way that would vitiate the fundamental ontological distinction between creature, between creature and creator, and, in line with Barth's characterization of the Lutherans, identify God with the world. In response to the Reform teaching, uh, the Lutherans insist that the Word is entirely in the flesh and never outside it. Faced with the problem of explaining how the finite human nature could be coextensive with the infinite divine nature, they appeal to the classical doctrine of the communication of attributes, arguing that the union of the divine and human natures in Christ legitimize not only the ascription of the properties of both, of both natures to the one person, the classic view, which performed also accepted, but also the communication of the properties of divinity, including omnipresence, to the human nature. In other words, for the Lutherans, if it is the case, as the Reformed agreed, that Jesus is without qualification the Son of God, so that the personal designations, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Word, etc., are fully convertible with one another, and, as the Reformed also agreed, that Jesus is the human Son of Mary, then it is impossible to affirm that the Word subsists apart from the human nature after the Incarnation, since a Word who is not at every point human is simply not Jesus, and thus not the Christian Lord and Savior. As compelling as that position may appear, however, the conceptual difficulties that attend it are considerable. For all the Lutherans inveighing against Reformed captivity to metaphysics, their arguments could also take a decidedly metaphysical cast. For example, an emphasis on the union of natures could lead at least some Lutherans to suggest that Jesus' humanity was effectively divinized from the moment of conception, uh, in a way that gave substance to the Reformed charge that the Lutheran position amounted to monophysitism, or worse. After all, if Jesus' humanity was omnipresent from conception, then it followed that on the day of his birth, his human nature was no more present in Bethlehem than in Rome or on the moon. In this way, the effort to affirm God deep in the flesh 
brought at least some Lutherans very close to collapsing the distinction between the created and the uncreated in the incarnate word. In the face of these deep differences, I would like to suggest that the best way to get some purchase on the debate is to call into question a point on which both sides agree, that the word did exist outside the flesh before the incarnation. Lutherans and Reformed were one in their belief that in the life of the word, excuse me, Lutherans and Reformed were one in their belief that the life of the word could be conceived in terms of two sequential states. First and from all eternity, the Logos as Sarkos, the word without flesh, and then from the time of Jesus' conception, the Logos and Sarkos, the enfleshed word. While the point at issue in the extra Calvinisticum debate had to do with the propriety of continuing to invoke this distinction between asarkos and ensarkos after the word took flesh. The problems attending both sides are arguably rooted in their shared understanding of what it might be called the word's prehistory. So I move to the logos asarkos. It is a remarkable feature of modern theology that the question of the logos asarkos, that is, a pre-existent second identity of the Trinity, who is not yet Jesus, has become a point of significant debate at all. For there are arguably few matters of Christian confession that were less controversial over the first 1900 years or so of the Church's life. Across the whole range of Christian reflection on the Incarnation, from the Angel and Spirit Christologies of the Sub-Apostolic Period, through the Logos Christologies of the Apologist, on to Nicaea, and the later Christological debates, uh, all sides, um, agreed with the pre-existence apart from the flesh of the one who assumed flesh in Jesus. The fourth evangelist, after all, seems to state quite clearly that the word was with God in the beginning and only subsequently became flesh and lived among us. How else to describe the word's life in the interim than as asarkos? In this, as in so many other matters of contemporary theology, it was Bart who upset the apple cart. In light of the fact of the Incarnation, he insisted, we simply, his words, cannot imagine a Logos in itself, which does not have this content and form, which is the eternal word of God without this form and content, that is, the humanity of Jesus. To suggest he might, Bart argued, is to posit a gap between who God is in God's self and how God shows God's self to be in Jesus, and thereby to shift the object of real theological interest from the flesh and blood human being from Galilee to the eternal reality of which he is simply the temporal manifestation. This in turn opens the door to a situation in which, part again, the title of a Logos Asarkos is under, me, under the title of a Logos Asarkos, we pay homage to a Deus Absconditus, and therefore to some image of God which we have made for ourselves. Moreover, just to the extent that this Deus Absconditus is capable of being distinguished from the Deus Revelatus in Jesus, the image of God we create may well end up quite different from what we are shown in Christ, capricious and cruel rather than loving and merciful, for example. Bard insisted that any such prizing of the word from the fleshy reality of Jesus fails to reckon with Jesus' status as the primordial object of divine election. Even in the beginning, he insisted, God was not without man since God's eternal election, man since in God's eternal election, man exists in this one, Jesus Christ, as the beginning of all God's ways and works, and therefore at the beginning of all things with God himself. And yet if on these grounds Bart can characterize the Logos Asarkos as an abstraction, he also concedes that it remains indispensable for dogmatic inquiry and presentation. There is, for Bart, no knowledge of God which on any pre pretext or in any way can escape his humanity, and no place for the Logos Asarkos in theological epistemology. Still, it does not appear to be an ontologically empty category for him, since he insists that it is legitimate and imperative that by the expression Son or Word of God we should understand the second mode of existence of the inner divine reality in itself and as such, his words. If for Bart this understanding alone is inadequate, the concept nevertheless retains a place in his dogmatics. By contrast, and in an explicit parting of the ways from Bart, Robert Jensen has argued that the concept of the Logos Asarkos is fundamentally misplaced altogether. In Jensen's view, the Christian doctrine of God, the Trinity, constitutes a frontal challenge to the equation of divinity with timelessness that he sees at the heart of the Hellenic religio-philosophical system of antiquity in which Christianity arose. 
The God revealed in Jesus, he maintains, is not above or beyond time, but rather subsists in and through time as event. Divine transcendence is, for him, therefore, not to be conceived vertically as existence above and outside of time, but, so to speak, horizontally, as bracketing time, so that God is the one to whom nothing is either prior or future, not only unoriginate, but also unsurpassable. The structure of transcendence, he writes, is not the persistence of a nature, it is the freedom of the future to overcome all persistence. It follows that for Jensen, the classic distinction between imminent and economic trinities must be reconceived in horizontal terms. Rather than being understood as existing before the events in space and time that make up the salvation historical economy, he interprets the imminent trinity eschatologically, as the ultimate in the sense of unsurpassable vindication of God's deity. In this eschatologically oriented framework, there is no logos asarkos independent of the logos in flesh is Jesus. Because the deity of the Son, rather than being the precondition of Jesus' ministry, is its outcome, that which is revealed and thereby constituted in his resurrection from the dead and into God's unsurpassable future. It is thus the post-existence, his word, constituted by the resurrection that is theologically decisive for Jesus' status as God's Son since it is as unlimited future, rather than stable past, that God's lordship is vindicated. The Logos Asarkos thus becomes conceptually superfluous, because Jesus is determined as God's son by the resurrection of his human body, and not by some form of disembodied existence that precedes his incarnation. Yet, even though Jensen rejects the idea of the Logos Asarkos, he does not altogether dispense with the idea of pre-existence since he concedes that it's necessary to affirm the logical priority of God as creator to the human, and thus the created being of Jesus. Jensen seems to make sense of this through the Old Testament, in which the Son indeed precedes his human birth without being simply unincarnate, insofar as, Jensen writes, what ontologically precedes the birth of Mary to Jesus is the narrative pattern of being going to be born to Mary, unquote. In other words, the fact that the Old Testament is itself part of the story of the Father's sending and Jesus' obedience that constitutes the Son, and the, and the persistence of this narrative pattern means that even in the Old Testament, the Logos cannot be separated from Jesus, and so, from Jensen's perspective, is not unincarnate, at least in the sense that he understands the classical doctrine of Logos Asarkos. Notwithstanding this concession to the, on the point of pre-existence, however, Jensen remains implacably opposed to the idea of God conceived as existing in any sense above the flow of time. This is particularly evident in his recent dismissal of the question of whether God would have been Trinity even if God had not created the world, and thus had not become incarnate, a question he had previously answered in the affirmative as nonsense. It is hard, at least for me, to interpret this position as signaling anything other than a complete collapse of God into time. For the question to which Jensen now refuses to allow an answer gains whatever sense it has from the presupposition that God's being is not reducible or exhausted by God's work in history. Thus, once the question's sense is denied, it becomes difficult to see how it continues to be possible to see the divine economy as a matter of grace. At best, one would seem driven to conclude that the categories of freedom and necessity, too, become nonsense when applied to the divine economy. With what I take to be the pitfalls of Jensen's approach in mind, although I, as a fellow Lutheran, will argue that the extra Calvinisticum should be rejected, I will do so, contra Jensen, by way of a characteristically reformed emphasis on divine transcendence. Now, to speak of God as transcendent is, among other things, to insist that God, precisely as creator and lord of all, is not to be regarded as one entity alongside others. Because all creatures are absolutely dependent on God, while God is not dependent on or relative to any non-divine reality, God and creatures do not exist on the same ontological plane. It follows that the relationship between God and creatures is non-competitive, whereas no two creatures can occupy just the same position or produce just the same effect, since the presence or activity of one will necessarily displace to some extent the others, God's presence and action do not crowd out creatures' capacities in this way. On the contrary, because God is creator, creatures' presence and activity at every point depends on God's. For while my existence entails that I occupy a location and sphere of activity apart from other creatures, it does not entail that my activity be separated from God's in this way, since without God's continually upholding and enabling my being, 
I cannot exist at all. Crucially, I think, it is just these qualities of divine transcendence that make the Incarnation, at least interpreted in Chalcedonian terms, coherent. Were God not transcendent, then in taking flesh, either his divinity would be reduced to his humanity, or the presence of divinity would necessarily entail his humanity's diminishment, some piece crowded out. But a transcendent God does not have to displace the human in order to be fully present in the human being, Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, it's a corollary of divine transcendence that in one respect, God is no more present in Jesus than in any other creature, since as creator, God is fully present in every creature as the one who holds it in being. What is distinct about Jesus is that in this one case, God claims this creature's being as God's own, so that God is not really the cause of Jesus walking, talking, eating, and so forth, as is the case with any human being. Rather, Jesus walking, talking, and eating are God's own actions. That is what it means to say Jesus of Nazareth is God, or more specifically, the Word, who assumes a human nature. That Jesus' humanity is not just sustained in its being and activity by God, but that it is God's very own. In the language of the Council of Chalcedon, Jesus is one person, a single someone, the Word of God, in two natures. At once divine, the Word for all eternity, and human, from the moment of his conception in Mary's womb. Something of the character of this relationship between the divine and the human may be suggested by drawing an analogy between God's taking flesh in Jesus, incarnation, and a novelist who makes herself a character in her novel, call it inscription. In a manner parallel to God's relationship to the incarnate Jesus, the human author's relationship to the inscribed version of herself is in many respects exactly the same as her relationship to all the other characters in the world of the novel. For herself, no less than for every other character, she determines directly and completely every aspect of existence, including both every external circumstance that impinges on her and every inner disposition that shapes her response to those circumstances. The sole difference is that the author identifies this character as herself such that her actions are also the author's actions. Now on this analogy, which like all analogies of course uh, has only so much uh, uh, tether you can give it, we can talk more about this later, it makes no sense to think of God's taking flesh and becoming a human as an event or development in the life of the Word. To think of the incarnation in this way, as though it were, for example, to take Kierkegaard's classic illustration, like a king deciding to take up the life of a beggar, fails to pay due regard to transcendence. By suggesting that the Incarnation entails a movement of God from heaven to earth, such language implies that God and the world exist again on the same ontological plane, but this is a mistake. God's transcendence of the world means that nothing happens to God and becoming a human being, any, any, uh, more than anything happens to an author who becomes a character in her novel. <clears throat> Now, at first glance, this claim may seem inconsistent with the biblical descriptions of the Word who has come down, who is from heaven, who emptied himself and became flesh. But if the hypostasis who is the subject of all these actions is divine and thus transcendent, it follows that what is being described in these verses is neither a transformation nor a relocation. In assuming a human life, the Word neither ceases to be God, since the Word could not do so without ceasing to be the Word, nor moves from one place to another since one who is omnipresent cannot move. Any more, again, than an author who becomes a character, thereby ceases to be the author, or moves into the novel from some other space. In this way, the idea that the word existed extra carnum before the incarnation falsely conflates the modes of existence proper to creator and creature by locating them on a common timeline. But while it is certainly true that during the age of the dinosaurs, or any other time before Jesus' birth, the word was not enfleshed, or even considered from a post-incarnational perspective, not yet in flesh, it would be wrong to conclude that the word then subsisted in an unenfleshed state. To do so, to speak of a Logos Asarchos existing prior to the Logos Ensarchos, is to have failed to grasp Christianity's central claim, that the incarnation just is the full and unqualified revelation of the eternal word. If the Incarnation were truly a becoming or modification of the Word, the King becoming a beggar, for example, then it would not be such a full revelation, since it would of necessity not include that which came before the Word's enfleshment. But because the Logos Ensarchos just is the Word revealed in time, it makes no sense, I would say, to speak of the state of the Word before the Incarnation, since the very language of before plots divinity and eternity uh, plots divine eternity and created time along a single temporal sequence. 
Prior to Jesus' birth, the word is not apart from the flesh, asarpos, not even as the one who is to become enfleshed. Rather, to confess the incarnation is to recognize that there is no Christianly coherent way of referring to the word, except just as the one who is Jesus, the word made flesh. Importantly, however, this conclusion does not mean, for me, that the phrase logos asarpos is simply to be rejected. On the contrary, and here I see myself following the spirit, if not the letter of Bart, it has two legitimate functions. First, it serves as a means of affirming the free and gracious character of the Incarnation, since it is only by positing a word in itself and as such, as the Incarnation's presupposition, that it is possible to avoid the conclusion that the word is inherently and by nature in flesh. Secondly, adherence to the Chalcedonian principle that the divine and human natures are united in Christ without confusion or change, make it necessary to affirm that the word remains asarkos, according to the divine nature, even after the incarnation, in the same way that after the incarnation, the word remains invisible and immortal, according to the divine nature. This is the particular bearing of the extra Calvinistic of the idea. In both these legitimate functions, however, and this is my important point, I think, the point of distinguishing the word from the flesh is purely regulative. That is, it serves particular theological principles the graciousness of the incarnation of the integrity of the divine nature, and is not descriptive of an ontological state, that is, a mode of subsistence of the word apart from the flesh. In this respect, the affirmation of a dogmatically regulative logos asarkos is properly distinguished from the confession of an ontologically substantive extra Calvinisticum, such that the Reformed are right to hold the former and the Lutherans to deny the latter. Still, once the idea of the Logos Asarkos is reframed in strictly regulative terms, the idea of the word extra carnum either before or after the Incarnation must be judged inconsistent with the conviction that Jesus simply is the Word, and not simply a form or manifestation of the Word. Even if, following Chalcedon, his divine nature remains unchangeably immaterial and corporeal. In short, it is licit to speak of the Word as unenfleshed according to the divine nature, that is, that incorporeality is an eternal property of divinity, but not to speak of the word subsisting apart from the flesh, the extra Calvinisticum. To revert to Bart's language, the incarnation means that the word is neither present in the world, since the divine nature retains its integrity, nor absent from the world, since there is no word other than Jesus. As Maximus the Confessor, whom I cannot help but mention, if I talk about <laughs> noted long before the Reformation, Jesus is not simply from or into natures, as though the hypostasis were a tertium quid alongside divinity and humanity. Rather, he just is the natures. They are the substance of his being, and as such, no less inseparable from each other than from the divine hypostasis. To imagine one to be present without the other would be to confess a son of God who is not to be identified with the son of Mary. And this is just what the incarnation rules out. How this can be eludes our conceptual resources, even as we lack such resources to speak so coherently about the eternal word prior to his temporal enfleshment. But it remains the case that once the word is confessed to have taken flesh in Jesus, he is never to be thought of, believed, or called upon apart from his humanity. Which means, of course, that he is not to be thought of as existing in an infinite way outside of his humanity either. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. It's also my happy duty to introduce our respondent. And here, I think I will just say, in the beginning was Mike Gray, <laughs> and he created the Logos Conference. <laughs> One of the candidate names for the Logos workshops was Bill Fee. <laughs> with slogans like getting down and dirty and philosophical theology. <laughs> I shudder to think what Sally Mapstone's address would have sounded like if you had stuck with that name. <laughs> uh, let me just add my voice uh, to the chorus of thanks going out to Alan, Andrew, Diana, Bethany, and Ryan for all their hard work in organizing the conference and for the invitation to speak here. This is the first Logos conference I've spoken at. Uh, it takes a lot of hard work to put together a conference like this, and they've done a terrific job. And I'd like to thank Ian for his rich and provocative paper. There's a lot to engage, and I can't possibly hope to do it full justice. I'll focus on just two issues. 
First, the question whether Ian's appeal to divine transcendence succeeds in resolving the dilemma which, on his telling, is presented to us by the debate over the extra Calvinisticum. And second, the question whether his appeal to divine transcendence is necessary to resolve that dilemma. I'll apologize for my voice. I've got a cold, but I can't seem to shake. First, some terminology. Let's use the term, the word, to refer to the second person of the Trinity, the one who became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. Let's use the term Jesus to refer to the word incarnate, leaving open the question of whether the word is strictly identical to Jesus or bears some other interesting relationship to him. Following Ian, let us for now characterize the extra Calvinisticum as the doctrine that the word continues to exist apart from or outside the flesh after the incarnation, and let's take the Lagos and Sarkos doctrine to be the thesis that the word existed without flesh prior to the incarnation. As Ian describes it, the debate over the extra Calvinisticum presents us with the following dilemma. If we affirm it, then, according to the Lutherans, we risk denying Jesus' full humanity. The reason, he says, is that allowing a post-incarnational separation of the word from the flesh puts at risk the claim that the word is, without qualification, Jesus, the fully human son of Mary. But if we deny the extra Calvinisticum, then, according to the Reformers, we risk divinizing Jesus' human nature. On Ian's telling of the Reformed position, denying the extra Calvinisticum implies that, quote, the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus involves the local or spatial coincidence of the two natures, end quote. Which, in turn, implies that Jesus' human nature has divine properties like omnipresence assuming, anyway, that the Word doesn't abandon the core divine attributes in the Incarnation. Ian proposes to resolve the dilemma by challenging the Lagos Asarkos doctrine. On his view, proper attention to divine transcendence reveals a kind of metaphysical mistake in supposing that, at any point, the Word might exist apart from the flesh of Jesus. According to Ian, divine transcendence implies, quote, that God is not to be regarded as one entity alongside others, End quote, and that, quote, God and creatures do not exist on the same ontological plane, end quote. From this, he thinks two conclusions follow. First, nothing happens to God in becoming human, so the incarnation involves no genuine change or transition from a discarnate state to an incarnate state. Hence, the Lagos of Sarkos doctrine is mistaken, at least if it's construed as it usually is, as telling us something about how the word existed prior to the incarnation. Second, as he puts it, quote, the relationship between God and creatures is non-competitive, whereas no two creatures can occupy just the same position or produce just the same effect. God's presence and actions do not crowd out creatures' capacities in this way, end quote. Accordingly, the fact that the divine and human natures somehow coincide in Jesus in no way counts against the capacity of Jesus' human nature to be limited and localized in time and space while the word retains the divine attributes, thus dissolving the concern about divinizing Jesus' human nature. Ian's response to the extra Calvinistican debate will be a non-starter for anyone not attracted to the controversial and somewhat obscure idea that God and creatures exist on different ontological planes, which I take to be equivalent to the thesis that God and creatures enjoy different modes of being. But let's grant that part of the response and ask instead whether it really calls the Lagos of Sarkos doctrine into question. Here's a reason for thinking that it doesn't. The Lagos of Sarkos doctrine is, again, the claim that prior to the Incarnation, the Word existed without flesh. If that doctrine is false, then at least one premise in the following argument must be false. One, there was a time T prior to the Incarnation, Two, at T, the following proposition was true. The word exists and is not incarnate. Three, necessarily, if something exists and is not incarnate, then it exists without flesh. Four, therefore, at T, the following proposition was true. The word exists without flesh. So far as I could tell, the doctrine of divine transcendence doesn't call any of these premises into question. And so, as far as I can tell, it does not call the Lagos of Sarkos doctrine into question either. 
But if it doesn't call that doctrine into question, then neither does it call the extra Calvinisticum, as characterized by Ian, into question. So one question I have for Ian is why we should think that the appeal to divine transcendence does the work that he seems to think it will do in resolving the dilemma presented by the extra Calvinisticum debate. The second question is whether there really is a dilemma in the first place. Recall Ian's characterization of the extra Calvinisticum. The word continues to exist apart from or outside the flesh after the incarnation. And part of the point of the doctrine is to guard against understanding the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus as a matter of the local or spatial coincidence of the two natures. Put thusly, it would seem that the extra Calvinisticum is obviously false. For to say that the word continues to exist apart from or outside the flesh after a certain time seems equivalent to saying that the word is, after that time, either wholly or partly discarnate. But of course, the word isn't wholly, isn't wholly discarnate after the incarnation. To say as much is incoherent. And to say that the word is partly discarnate after the incarnation is to say both that the word has parts, which is theologically questionable, and that only part of the word ever became incarnate which is tantamount to denying that the word in the Incarnation became fully human. Not everyone expresses the extra Calvinisticum in quite the way that Ian has, however. Calvin himself expressed the view this way, quote, For even if the word in his immeasurable essence united with the nature of man into one person, we do not imagine that he was confined there. Here is something marvelous. The Son of God descended from heaven in such a way that without leaving heaven, he willed to be born in the virgin's womb, to go about the earth and hang upon the cross. Yet he continually filled the world, even as he had done from the beginning. End quote. For Calvin, then, the question addressed by the doctrine is whether the word is confined within the human nature in such a way as to preclude the word from continually filling the world, even as he had done from the beginning. One can give Calvin's talk of confinement a spatial, locational interpretation, but one does not have to. One could instead interpret it as simply denying that Christ's human nature limits the powers of the word in various ways. This seems to be how Oliver Crisp understands the doctrine when he characterizes it as stating, quote, that while the second person of the Trinity was incarnate in the person of Christ, he was simultaneously providentially sustaining the cosmos, end of quote. And Crisp's characterization is well in accord with those offered by a variety of other Reformed theologians. As I see it, the question at issue with the extra Calvinisticum is not specifically one about the spatial and the local coincidence of the two natures, but whether the Incarnation somehow presented the exercise of certain divine attributes. One might think that the two issues intersect in the question whether the Word remained omnipresent while incarnate. It is, after all, natural to think that the incarnation of the Word as a physically located man would preclude the Word from being omnipresent unless the Word were somehow also spatially separate from or located outside Jesus' physical borders. There is, in fact, no reason to think this unless we make the further, entirely optional assumption that omnipresence implies omnilocatedness. We could instead understand omnipresence simply to be a matter of having causal access to and direct experiential awareness of the goings-on at every physical location. If this is correct, the Word might well be located where Jesus is, even as the Word is, unlike any other human being, omnipresent throughout space-time. Suppose, then, the Word is, without qualification, Jesus. And suppose further, if this is a further supposition, that the Word does not exist outside or apart from the flesh. In light of Ian's presentation of the debate, Making these assumptions concedes to the Lutherans the central claims on their side of the debate. But given that omnipresence does not imply omnilocatedness, these suppositions pose no obstacle to saying that the word remains omnipresent while incarnate. Nor do they seem to pose any obstacle to saying that the word possesses and indeed exercises the other essential divine attributes. Moreover, we seem to be in no danger of divinizing the flesh of Jesus. For there is no hint here that the flesh of Jesus manifests divine attributes like omnipresence. So it would appear that the Calvinists have gotten what they want out of the debate as well. As I see it then, the dilemma that Ian takes to be presented by the extra Calvinisticum debate 
is largely an artifact of a location-based interpretation of what it would be for the word not to be confined in the flesh of Jesus, together with a location-based understanding of omnipresence. Both are optional at best, and in fact, neither seems to me to have much to recommend it. Once both are abandoned, however, the dilemma appears to dissolve, and along with it, the terms of the debate as I understand them. The second question I have for Ian, then, is whether there's a way of reviving the debate without casting the matter in locational terms. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, I've already expressed thanks to the Torrens, and I really should express uh, thanks to Mike, too, not only for his response to the paper, but uh, Mike uh, has invited me to Logos conferences for many, many years, and uh, as always, uh, he and his team have always provided the hospitality, which I know Alan and his team have been anxious to, to live up to and have done very, very well, but I've been extremely grateful for being part of the conversation, not simply today, but also back to whenever it was he first foolishly let me know. So thank you very much. Mike raises two lines of questions to my paper, and I want to start with the second. His proposal that much can be accomplished in addressing the extra Calvinisticum of the avoid interpreting omnipresence in terms of location or extension. I agree, and in fact, my aim was precisely to cut the Gordian knife, excuse me, to cut the Gordian knot of the debate by trying to address the fundamental theological concerns of both Lutheran and Reformed thinkers while sidestepping the question of ubiquity around which the debate usually turns. So I agree that divine omnipresence is not to be understood in terms of location. After all, if God is transcendent, God is not localized in space and time, except in the Incarnation. I should, however, note that this denial of a localized understanding of omnipresence is also the classical Lutheran position. Thus, the formula of Concord, which I'm going to quote now, so if you're wearing a hat, take it off. And... <laughs> uh, the formula of Concord lists among its anathemas the claim, quote, that the humanity of Jesus is locally extended to all parts of heaven and earth. Such local extension is not even to be ascribed to the divinity. And yet, unquote, and, yet, so have back up. and yet, precisely because the Lutherans are so clear on this point, at least, I think that the issue at stake in the extra-Calvinistic is slightly different than Mike suggests, and maybe that I was able to uh, put forth in the paper. That is, it's not whether the flesh prevents the exercise of divine attributes. Neither side, as far as I can see in the debate, suggests that it does. But whether the presence of Christ, the Logos, after Christmas always includes his human nature. That is, wherever, wherever there is the Logos, there also is the humanity. And here is where the Reformed teaching, I think, remains problematic. I certainly grant that the Reformed do not intend to teach that the word is ever disincarnate once the flesh has been assumed. But the Lutheran objection is that this is what they just end up saying. After all, and again I'll go back to the passage from Hepa, well, which I quote at the beginning of the paper and to which I allude at the end, he says in the same sentence that the word is never to be thought of outside of humanity and that the word exists in an infinite way outside his humanity. I would wish that, in fact, Reformed theologians were treating this as, uh, as Chris uh, does, but it seems to me if they do, the language of filling and outside and extra chops up an awful lot for that to be the sim simply the point. However, I don't want to let the Lutherans off the hook, because the Lutheran doctrine of the Danus Maiasoticum, the formal claim that they make that the human, nature's, uh, the human nature shares in the properties of the, of the divine nature by virtue of the hypostatic union, with its affirmation of the ubiquity of Christ's human nature, also has localized overtones, as, as Michael points out. So yes, get rid of spatialized or localized understandings of presence, of ubiquity. But in order to do this, and this gets to the second, uh, Michael's first point, I think it's necessary to follow through on the implications of the nature of divine transcendence. Yes, being is said in many ways, so different ontological planes. Precisely the kinds of clarification that lead to the conclusion that divine omnipresence is not a matter of omnilocation uh, means that the word uh, uh, points up to a, dis dis a deeper disagreement, I think, between Mike and myself. My position, again, is that the word was not in flesh prior to Jesus' conception, and that anyone with a point in time t prior to that event said the word exists is making a true statement. So I follow point two of Mark's argument, which in slightly expanded form is this, that the statements the word exists uttered at time t before the incarnation, and the statement the word is not incarnate uttered at time t before the incarnation are both true. What I want to deny is where Mike goes from there, that is, that it would also have been true on that basis to say at any time 
T before the incarnation, the word now exists in an uninfleshed state. I reject this proposition on the grounds that it predicates spatio-temporal categories to God the Word apart from the incarnation. Whereas again, such predication can only be made once the incarnation has taken place. This distinction rests on my insistence that God and creatures do not indeed exist on the same ontological plane. This means that the proposition, the Word exists, is an importantly different kind of affirmation than this podium exists, or I exist. I would illustrate or try to illustrate the difference as follows. It is valid to conclude that insofar as I existed before I grew a beard, and I did, I then existed in an unbearded state. But it's not likewise valid to infer that before the word became flesh, the word existed in an uninfleshed state. That would map the incarnation onto various sorts of creaturely becoming. And as I tried to argue in the paper, that kind of mapping is problematic. Not only because, or even primarily because, it's inconsistent with a particular view of the relationship between time and eternity, but more important because it, finally, it fatally qualifies what I take to be the claim that Jesus is the word without remainder, or in the language of Colossians 2, that in him the whole fullness of Godhead will follow him. We have some time for questions. Uh, Tim Paul first, and the second. Hello, thank you, Ian. I have a question about your use of authorities. It's seven times in the paper you cite Chalcedon, and you cite it in pointing to some predicates employed in it concerning Christ's natures, and it looked like you were using it like this. If somebody denies one of these predicates is true of the union, then that's sufficient to think their view is wrong. Uh, so it looks like you're using the definition of faith as somewhat authoritative there. My worry is this, that very same definition of faith includes uh, the form of the oath, and it includes the letters of Cyril. I mean, they don't put it all in there, yeah. but they say those things are also binding. But when you look at those, you get some things that are contrary to things I think you said in your paper. So I'm going to give you just two examples. One thing you said was that Lutherans insist, and you agreed, uh, that the word is entirely in the flesh and never outside of it. Here's what Cyril says, and you'll see that Calvin, uh, that Mike gave us, Calvin was, I think, cribbing on this, and maybe Chris was cribbing too. Cyril says this, For although visible as a child and in swaddling clothes, even while he was in the bosom of the virgin that bore him, here's the important part, as God he filled the whole of creation and was fellow ruler with him who got him. So there, as a child, he filled all of creation. And that seems problematic for your view. Second, you said, to speak of the Logos Asarchos existing prior to the Logos Ensarchos is to have failed to grasp Christianity's central claim. Here's what Leo says. He says, whilst remaining pre-existent, he begins to exist in time. So it looks like Leo has failed to grasp Christianity's central claim in that definition of faith that you proffered. So mild will vary, depending on how important you think sticking with those norms is. Uh, you might want to revise the view, and those of us who don't think it's so important might not have to revise the view. But I wonder what you think. Yeah. Uh, so a couple points. Uh, one is, um, yeah, I mean, I, I use Chalcedon as a as a reference point, and I think it actually provides a frame that's important that, that, that's helpful for talking about this. Uh, I actually have I have problems with Leo's tome in particular, although not that particular part you were talking about. So it's not. So I'm not. Uh, 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 I'm I'm not unhappy to to, to be dueling a bit with, 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 with the sources there. But in terms of, of the kinds of points that are trying to be made, um, uh, and again, uh, uh, I'm not a petrologist, I'm not going to try to interpret everything that's happening there and claim that I've got a handle on this. But this is where I do want to keep a regulative, what I call a regulative function of the doctrine in place. I do want to say, and, this, and, and here again I'm trying to stick with what I think is, uh, Cal Seaton is trying to say that is correct, namely that precisely the divine nature doesn't change. Right? And the divine nature has certain kinds of qualities. I mean, less controversial than some of the ones that end up in this debate is it's invisible. Um, well, it doesn't become visible in the incarnation, and as far as I know, nobody's claimed it does. Uh, that doesn't change the character of the divine nature. So, similarly, I want to say that if by asarkos or extra, you're simply trying to make a statement about the unchangeability of the properties of the divine nature, that is... The, the, the logos asarkos can do, you know, does decent work if, if, what, if, it's, if its function there is simply to secure that uh, without confusion or change half of Chalcedon. 
that's where I was trying to make a distinction. And again, how could this distinction fly for any length of time? I don't know. But a distinction between a regulative use and a descriptive use. So I, and there I, I do have problems with the notion of, um, well, again, I don't know what, exactly what Leo and, and Cyril had in their heads, so I don't want to try to project. But if, you're try, if it's the idea is to try to give a picture, and the picture is one of filling, and I think of mist, so I don't know, I don't want to, you know, again, project, but I just think, that, you know, that, then I just worry that, that, our, that our language can easily get ahead of us. I mean, it's certainly appropriate in liturgies and poet, you know, got the Bible's full of this kind of stuff. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and appropriately so. Um, we, and again, we, you know, we use words like, I use words like before and above. And what, you know, what does that all mean? But I, I, just, I just want to keep a sort of, um, uh, I want to keep, not a sort of, I want to keep, uh, for, uh, the, plea, the plea is for a, an attempt to see this as a way of framing and being careful about discourse that doesn't overly anthropomorphize, um, recognizing that there are still certain things that this language is trying to secure. And I was trying to do as what I could to do justice to what I think is the legitimate concerns of the reform position, which are precisely, if you're quite right, in terms of what Calvin <coughs> was quite interested in what Cyril had to say, uh, to make sure those things were in place. So that's how I respond. Thank you, Ian, for that terrific paper, um, and might be the response. I'll live for this stuff, it's fantastic. Um, in Return of the Jedi, Admiral Akbar <laughs> when they when the rebel fleet seeks to attack a fully operational Death Star. Uh, this question may be a trap, depending on how you respond to it. <laughs> In the paper, although you don't say this, it seems implied that you think the word is identical to Christ. So that's the trap, depending on how you respond to that. This may, that what follows may or may not be a problem. Um, if the word is identical to Christ, then there, there seem to be two issues, at least two issues in the nation that I would worry about. One is divine incorporeality, although you want to affirm that at the end of the paper. How is it, in other words, that Christ, uh, if he is divine and human in a way that requires the identity relation, that he remains incorporeal um, whilst being identical to um, his human nature in the, in the way that you're suggesting. And secondly, um, what does one do with the doctrine of divine simplicity? It looks like, on that view, um, God has a physical part. Um, yeah, well, here's where I want to uh, uh, lean very heavily on nature <coughs> hypothesis distinctions. Um, so in terms of identity, uh, what I want to say is, and I think this is, I, 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 I'll say things that I think are uncontroversial, which may not be, uh, and then say where I think maybe they get controversial. So I, I, I take it to be uncontroversial, that it's a, that it's a general principle that Reformed and Lutheran certainly would agree on, I think Catholic and Orthodox too. But they want to say that Word of God, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of Mary, Son of God, etc., etc., are fully convertible terms. So you can, you can, whatever sentence is true of, and this is what Bart wanted to push really hard, if you say, you know, uh, the Son of God died on the cross, that's, you know, Second Council of Constantinople. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is Lord of heaven and earth, right? Those, so those sorts of substitutions can be made. Um, so, uh, and, and, and that there's, and that that is a crucial point, this is sort of the issue in terms of the, whether I'm what's fatally compromising or not fatally compromising, that if you that the, the risk is if you if you don't make that identity, then there is then you have the Deus of Scotus. You have the that which is behind what is revealed, <coughs> and makes you wonder, well, this is nice what I see, but you know what's the grimacing thing behind the mask? Maybe. Okay, so that's why that has to be there. Um, what does the incarnation mean? And again, here in terms of the sort of the, the terminology that goes with it. Again, here Lutheran and Reformed, uh, along with uh, those other Catholic and Orthodox ones, I think are the same Chalcedon. It's there, is, there is one hypostasis, the second person of the Trinity, who, being eternally divine, now also assumes a human nature. Um, and I've given the, you know, I gave my little analogy there. Um, And here's where the without, here's what sort of the point of the without confusion or without change, without division or separation, right? I take it, I mean, uh, divine simplicity is not, as far as I can see, an immediate concern at Chalcedon as such. But I take it that part of what without uh, confusion or change is, desi is designed to do is to 
is precisely to protect whatever properties you want to ascribe to God, your maintain in place. Because the nature uh, isn't becoming other than what it was. What's happening is, again, God is claiming a creaturely existence as God's own and living that and, and living that in as the hypothesis he is. But the but the materiality of Jesus is creative materiality. It is not it is not divine. It is human stuff, bleeds, cries, you know, all the rest of the stuff. So, um, so at least, I, I mean, that, that notion of distinction, which again is why I think the Logos Asarkas does do some good work, is the way in which uh, I take it the tradition, and I wouldn't want to go with it here, wants to protect, I mean, it's a, I, I, I sort of, which sound like everybody's nervous, but you know, to, to, to at least to talk about the integrity of the divine nature, and that the incarnation isn't, uh, um, you know, something being added to divinity. It's divinity relating to creation in a, in, a, in a new sort of way. Does that get it? We started a little late, so if there are other questions, we can take some more uh, in the middle there. Thank you. Um, Taylor Telfer here with the Lagos Institute. Um, much of these debates centered around the understanding of communion um, in the Reformation. For example, Zwingli is trying to argue that the second person isn't actually present, and Luther is trying to prove that he's smarter by demonstrating that actually, no, uh, the second person can be present. And so I'm just curious, with that in mind, how do you see your position mapping onto um, the understanding of the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist? Is there a change? Um, in traditional Lutheran doctrine, or well, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty cool with traditional Lutheran. I mean, I, I'm Lutheran. I'm pretty yeah. cool with traditional Lutheran doctrine. I mean, of course, one of the things that's interesting about the way, I mean, we could get into all the sort of later history of, of, of the uh, of, uh, the communication of Athanasian Lutheran thought. In the formula itself, things are actually pretty vague. Uh, I shouldn't say vague is not quite the right word because I don't want to think anything you can say is vague. Uh, but there's a certain amount of flexibility. So uh, one, one can, I mean, there are places in the formula where it's pretty much said explicitly. Uh, what this means is that, that uh, Jesus is able to be present wherever Jesus wishes to be via the right hand of God. And what they're concerned about there principally is that this whole get, this all gets started, as you rightly say, because of the Eucharist. So, um, I want to be able to, I, I certainly want to be able to say that. Um, again, wherever, in, in fact, I mean, my own sort of inclination about this is to say, um, what is significant about what is at stake in this debate is when, I mean, God's presence in the world as a whole, the way in which God sustains creation is, as it were, a third person presence. I don't, I, I'm, I have absolute faith that I'm not here right now doing what I'm doing unless God is enabling and sustaining my being in every dimension of my being while I'm doing it. But I don't experience that. Uh, it just is there, okay? I trust that it's there. What happens when, what, what the point of Jesus for Christians is the culmination of God not being third person, but second person. God saying, here I am, uh, and I'm for you. And what I think is crucial about uh, what at least the Lutheran side wants to preserve in this is to say whenever that happens, because Jesus is the way that happens, and because Jesus is, because the Son of God is also the Son of Mary, to get back to, to Oliver's question, you can't say that Jesus is doing that apart from the humanity. I mean, that, that, uh, that somehow, if that's the case, you're not, again, you're not actually encountering Jesus. You're, you're encountering, this is, this is Bart, or form theology is concerned, something that is somehow conceptually separated, and that's what you don't want. So I, I think that the best of the Lutherans, I think when the Lutherans get into ubiquity, they're, they, 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 they say that, I mean, it's interesting, you know, the classic take on a Lutheran Reformed debate is that the Lutherans accuse of uh, Reformed of being Nestorian and the well, Reformed accuse the Lutherans of being Monophysites. But there's a great part in Hepa where he accuses the Lutherans of being Nestorian. It's terrific. It's a great little, you know, big. <laughs> on the grounds that they're working with pre existing notions of what divinity and humanity are like and trying to map them back and forth. I think that's a fair cop. Um, I think that actually goes against what Luther is. I mean, Luther, of course, is all over the place. But it's best. He wasn't doing that. But that's where sort of Kevinitz and the others went. Thank you. <laughs> one more back there. We'll take one more question after this one. Uh, Hi, thank you. Logan Williams from Durham University. Uh, you mentioned that the language of coming down or existed before or not yet incarnate 
are all inappropriate modes of speak because they conceive of divinity and humanity on the same ontological level of being. Uh, but what about texts in, in scripture which do depict the Son, a sarcos, um, I think of John 1, 1 and Philippians 2, 6, which then use Kai or day to talk about a next moment in the life of the word, which depicts this sarcos reality. Um, might these texts validate our admittedly limited modes of referring to the Logos of Sarkos if we speak them with the qualification that, the, that divinity and humanity do indeed not compete? Um, or do you think that we should reject those texts as theologically inadequate? <laughs> Uh, no, we should not reject those texts. Like, and, and I want to be clear, uh, being, uh, uh, what is appropriate in terms of, first of all, how God wants to speak to me is God's business, so I listen to God whenever God says, and even if God says, you know, God talks like that, I listen to it, it makes sense of it. So this is about, this is not a sermon, heaven forbid, this is theology, which is reflection on kind of the, the, the sort of second order, how do I think about what's happening here? So, I can only talk about God using human language, and I can only talk about things happening in sequence. And I can only think about them happening in sequence, heaven knows. And I certainly can only communicate, if I can do this only in my own head, I certainly can't communicate to anybody else any more clearly. So that language is not only in scripture, it is, it is language that is effective and has proven effective and is effective for me in communicating the gospel. So I, don't, I want to say all that's, that's well and good and amen and thank Jesus for doing all the things Jesus has done and, and all the writing that's come afterwards. Um, but what I want to, I mean, but I think then the question is, okay, we can take that language and run with it in all kinds of ways. And my concern is that we just be aware of ways we can run with it that can cause certain kinds of conceptual and terminological confusions and to have those in mind. And to recognize, yeah, these are, these are sort of, I mean, as all of it was, I mean, several people yesterday gave the notion of signposts or goals or things you're on off the edge of. Um, uh, Sarah gave a, uh, wrote a great paper on Calcedon some years ago about, you know, understanding what definition means, which is not, you know, again, not descriptive, but boundary defining. And that's really what this is about. This is about signposts, about, okay, you know, be careful that you don't allow the, the, the semantics of the words, which are there, uh, to lead you to conclusions that, that create problems elsewhere. So it's an exercise in systematic theology, and it's, not, it's certainly not about wanting to say, well, if I were writing the Gospel of John, darn it, I would have gotten it right. <laughs> given what the Gospel of John says, and given the significance of what that's trying to claim, again, it's, it's really, you know, how do you make John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14 come together? in a way that makes me, uh, here I have Bart's concern. This has to be, at, the goodness of this news is uh, non pare uh, And that means that, and that's why the identity question for me that Oliver raises is so important. That there's no, there's no daylight between what I see in Jesus and God's identity. Who God is, not simply for me, but who God is, period. Uh, and that's what these, Reflections are designed to sort of try to get a handle on. We'll take one more question. That there's the gentleman over here who's had his hand up. Hi, this is Bob Walker Edinburgh. I hope we would all agree with Rose Barton Luther that we know no God but the man Jesus. Uh, is the is one of the key problems not the extra? in the extra Calvinist and the use of the word outside and therefore the concept of space behind it. Uh, that the relation between God and the creation is not a spatial relation. And that's where that's the supreme significance of T. F. Lawrence's book Space Time and Incarnation. That we need uh, an, an Einsteinian view, not a new, uh, Newtonian view. Um, but and if we take that on board, it we it seems the, the the conflict in a sense disappears. And as regards the, I mean, if Christ is still man, which he is, and if in his resurrection he created the new creation in which his body is at one place and cannot be everywhere, but is there any reason why through the spirit he cannot be present everywhere? Okay. Uh, a couple things. So, so again, this, this, I mean, if you look at sort of the, the, the the way in which the back and forth goes in the scholastic debates of the 17th century. By the 18th century, everybody loses, you know, everybody becomes sort of happily gayest and forgets all about it. Uh, it becoming, what, what the Lutherans are constantly accusing the Calvinists, the Reformed, of having a spatialized view of, 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 of 
that, they, that the criticism that they make of the Lutherans, that omnipresence is incoherent, is because the Reformed can't disabuse themselves of a spatialized view of presence. Um, and the reform saying, and, and you know, no, that's not what we're saying. So it's, it, so that is, in, this is why, again, I think, I'm with Mike, I think we have to, there's something deeply unproductive about that line of reasoning. And I think uh, uh, Torrance's uh, gestures in that direction are, are, you know, are ways of trying to get around those sorts of things. So absolutely, yeah, I think that is not productive. And I think really, as I tried to want to say in the paper, I think both sides really, not simply don't always read each other with charity, that's also the case, but I think they really, they both end up get, getting into sort of metaphysical troughs that they can't dig themselves out of, it isn't helpful. Um, uh, so the second part was about Jesus' humanity and the new creation, I'm sorry, can you say it again? Yeah, Christ is risen, and if the, Christ is risen, and if, as a risen human being, a body can only be at one space, then he is at that one space in the new creation. Uh, but through the spirit, it can be present everywhere. All oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, see, see and, and th this raises some interesting questions. That the spirit, and the, the spirit, first of all, is the spirit of Jesus. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the New Testament teaching uh, is clear. Um, but Trinitarianly, the spirit is not the son. So, uh, so to, to speak of the spirit's presence um, is, 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 a, is, in this sense, it doesn't, it won't do the work I think you want it to do, at least in terms of the... Um, uh, the, the concerns would animate that debate because, for example, the, I mean, the, so going back to the Eucharistic question, right? Uh, neither side would deny that the Spirit was present and active in the Eucharist, right? Or in the Lord's Supper or Communion, because they would have, the Eucharist would not have been happy for the Reform. Um, but, you know, in that event. But the Reform had this idea of what? You, you feed in, in Christ on his, on, in your heart by faith and ascend to Him where He is at the right hand. Whereas the Lutherans have this notion of you know, presence there and now. So the spirit isn't, isn't an issue there. It's precisely if, insofar as Jesus is present, and yes, Jesus is a human being, and human beings are creatures, but insofar as we don't have a word that isn't Jesus, uh, and that thus isn't human, there needs to be some claim of the humanity being present at more places than the right hand of God. I mean, again, neither side would say the right hand of God is, a, you know, is like three by three space at the side of the throne, <laughs> that, that, that kind of displacement. So I don't, so the, so the spirit wouldn't do it because they both say, yeah, the spirit's, yeah, the spirit's fine, because the spirit's a third person of the Trinity, and it's Jesus' spirit, but it's not, but it's not the second person, and that, it's, it's the presence of the second person that they're anxious about. Now, with these excellent pieces of information before you, I turn to the even more excellent task of thanking our speaker for a wonderful talk.